Question time. Uh, all the normal rules apply. Um, could uh, you raise your hands if you have a question? Someone will deliver you a microphone. Yes, table 11. Uh, Paul Patterson, head of the newly established Bureau of Communications Research in the Commonwealth Government. Uh, Mr Fraser, thanks very much for your fascinating and compelling inaugural public address. Uh, it, it held my attention all the way through, I can assure you. Um, in talking about productivity, you mentioned the essential attention to financial markets, labour markets, infrastructure markets, goods and services markets. From my perspective, the same sort of attention needs to be given to markets in the digital space. Uh, that is, making sure those markets work as efficiently as possible. I wonder if people in the Treasury are also looking at that potential driver of productivity growth. I'm sure you're well aware of what's called the Solow paradox. Uh, Robert Solow, the famous economist, said in the late 1990s, you can see computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics and my sense is a bit of that prevails today as well. Um, would you mind commenting on that issue? Well, I, I, I won't pretend I'm totally, totally on top of the issue, but uh, one of the things that struck me since I've returned is the massive breadth of what Treasury has to deal with. Um, we don't have the, uh, um, the delight of just dealing with monetary policy. We actually have to deal with a full range of macroeconomic policies and industry policies, and we covered some there. Uh, in the work that I have seen to date, the disruptive technology developments has been seen as one of the very welcome developments. We've of course seen it here in Sydney with Uber, which I've yet to use, but uh, with Uber in the taxi industry. We've seen it clearly in the communications and the media industry. And uh, all I can say is that uh, uh, our industry area and what Ian Harper's doing, what the Productivity Commission's doing, and also what Rod Sims is doing at the ACCC will certainly uh, uh, alive to these issues. Another question? Yes. Gentleman in the blue tie, obviously aspiring politician. <laughs> I don't know whether to ask the question now. <laughs> Um, John, I want to go back to the, your introduction from Nick Greiner on uh, the issue or the relative um, exception you are of someone from the private sector coming into a, a senior government role and I was wondering if you could reflect, if you had any reflections on that move that you could share with us and whether after being out of the public sector for 20 years coming back into it there's any thing that you've come to your attention or you, you think has changed dramatically over that period? Yeah, well, I, uh, just following on Nick's comment, uh, I, I, I bought, I think over the past three years, uh, my wife was good enough to buy me probably about 12 terrific blue ties, <laughs> which have all been consigned to the bottom of the wardrobe now. <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, it, it hasn't been easy. I mean... Uh, there's many people, and there's many people in this room, and there's many, many people at the Treasury who do the job because they love their country. Uh, I like to think there's a particular love of Treasury as well. Uh, but I must say, coming back into the Commonwealth Public Service, um, you, you've got to jump the hurdles. It's not as if people are pulling the hurdles down for you. You've got to jump them. And I found that very difficult in the private sector when you you're trying to attract somebody, uh, you sort of make an effort to make it <laughs> interesting. Um, you might be seduced at times, but uh, by and large, they try to make it interesting. And I've got to say the bureaucracy uh, that I found when I was first approached uh, was just extraordinary. Uh, little things like, <laughs> you know, nobody thinks that uh, they might give you a quid to help with your uh, travel. I, you know, I'm lucky enough, it doesn't matter, but I, I, we're trying to hire some people overseas at the moment. Uh, we have a global infrastructure hub that will be established here in Sydney and uh, the people handling it in Treasury are very aware now that you've got to make it attractive. Crossing the street is a lot easier if you're doing it from Sydney to Canberra or Sydney to Melbourne. If you come from London or New York to Sydney, it's a pretty big 
jump. Most people have ties, both personal, personal and financial. And I think the public service in Canberra needs to look at that very closely. Fortunately, with Michael Thorley, the new head of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and John Lloyd, the new um, Public Service Commissioner, there, I think the three of us have a very real recognition we've got to do something about that. We're trying to do it in Treasury uh, by getting people who can work from Sydney and Melbourne and help us. People who've got specialist skills, people who don't necessarily want to commit to a, a lifelong career in Treasury, maybe one and a half, two, three years. People who can add that to the CV and augment the skills and through a process of osmosis with the very good people we've got in Canberra, lift ourselves. And the only way we can do that is really uh, not ignore, but you know, create our own rules in a way. And I've been helped very much by some of the big uh, accounting firms. I was talking earlier uh, with KPMG, with Peter Nash down in Melbourne, and uh, we'll get two or three people to come on to comment with us there. But I'm very conscious that I've got to talk to them and say, look, we'll help you through the the hurdles. We'll help you jump those. In terms of Treasury after 22 years, well, I mentioned it's got a massive waterfront of things to cover. And the staff numbers, we're tired. Uh, recently I had to ban people from coming in at the weekend. Uh, people in Treasury have good hearts, as the Chinese say. It's not a case of having to push them to work. It's actually a case of saying, steady on, I don't want you working on Saturdays and Sundays as a matter of course, because there is a thing in economics called diminishing returns to scale, and indeed I think once you get to Sunday night, there's probably negative returns to scale. <laughs> and I think uh, it's very sad because I think a lot of people don't recognise the great commitment by public servants, and it gets they're the easy whipping boy for the politicians, for the press. Uh, the other thing that's changed is uh, clearly the size and the role of the minister's offices have grown dramatically. We've got four ministers, uh, we've got upwards of 30 advisers, and they're very dedicated people. There's no doubt they're very dedicated, and many of them are very, very good. And to make sure that we have a Treasury view that is transmitted in a cogent way and that we stick on message, because once you get off message, Things, as I said recently, gets lost in translation. And that's what I'm doing with my deputies and the senior executive service to make sure that we're not responding willy-nilly to requests and that we do have that discipline, that discipline to say no. And that, that's, it. that's a huge challenge because, not commenting on previous governments, the rise of this new model, which began in the early 90s, really has accelerated, I think, probably in the past 10 years or so. Yep. Uh, John Dick Warbert, CETA Governor. Um, thank you for your speech and thank you for giving CETA the, uh, uh, the privilege of having you give your first speech thank here. You. Uh, if I can just make one quick comment that you made earlier about the potential to swap um, people from either the government into business or business into government. Um, I think it's a great idea and if we can do that in the, in the Board of Taxation. We did do that for um, a number of years. We brought persons in from the government yeah. into the business side and a business person into Treasury for two year spells. Um, so I just made that comment that was hugely successful, but I don't think too many others did the same thing. Uh, but look, my question is, um, we have a, a very substantial tax report sitting up in the shelf somewhere in the archives of uh, Canberra, the Henry Tax Review. Uh, I'm intrigued with your comments that have been in the press and what you've said today. Will you be pulling that down and looking at that in conjunction with the white paper that's coming out on tax reform? Yeah, just on the comments, uh, I should have mentioned, uh, apart from uh, Michael Thorley and uh, John Lloyd, I mean, uh, Chris Jordan's been fantastic coming in from KPMG into uh, the ATO. Um, it's just terrific. Uh, he's bringing in people to consultation with the private sector. And uh, I didn't know his predecessors, but uh, uh, it's hard to imagine we, we could have a better uh, tax commissioner. He's terrific. Uh, look, when we do the tax, uh, tax is incredibly uh, complicated and complex and highly political. We would be totally, totally foolish not to take advantage of the work that's been done to date. Uh, what I would love to happen is that we have an open discussion about taxation. It clearly involves the states in a very serious way. It involves business, but it also involves people and it involves the superannuation industry. 
and I do hope that the uh, discussion paper will be one where we can uh, usher in a period of uh, mature debate. I live in hope. I live in hope, my friend. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, Percy Allen, uh, CEDA trustee. John, after 23 years without recession in this country, how are you and your Treasury colleagues going to persuade the public and politicians that this country needs to make necessary but very difficult reforms? Well, we're starting by trying to look very sad when, wherever we come out <laughs> and uh, miserable. We don't tell jokes anymore and we, we cry a bit. No, seriously, Percy, um, it is a difficult task. Uh, a couple of Saturdays ago, I took my two big sons and three mates. We went down to Australia, England. Great game, good result. I'm a dual citizen, so I never lose on these things mm -hmm. anymore. Um, but I think I got the cheapest tickets. That, that was 60 bucks each in the MCG. Uh, people were paying eight bucks for a mid-strength beer. They were paying six bucks 50 for a little bucket of chips. And nobody was complaining. There were 85,000 people there in glorious delight. And it is. We, we, we live a great life. You go down to Bondi Beach at the weekend. It's hard, and this is the difficulty to, and this is why I think uh, government, I think opposition, I think commentators, I think the press even, although sometimes you wonder. Uh, I've got to say the media cycle here is extraordinary. I used to think the media cycle in uh, London was pretty full on, but here it's extraordinary. I think they've now and again just got to take a look back. We're not saying the place is falling apart. We are saying, as I said earlier, that we're living a great life, but we've got to think about our children and we've got to think about our grandchildren. And they're not going to thank us. Well, we, we might be pushing up daisies. But it's tough, Percy. It's tough and I don't want to wait until we get a crisis. I don't want to see the resolution coming through a crisis. I would like it to come because we do get a bipartisan approach on some of the issues. I am, I am delighted to see the growth of think tanks. Uh, John Daly at the Grattan Institute was up uh, the other week, has done some terrific work. I know there's a lot of other think tanks and I think you know, more power to them. One of the great things when I was in Washington DC was to see the plethora of think tanks that were giving very good advice, often with people coming out of government and using their skills. It's a battle. I don't want to sound as though I'm a martyr, but it's a battle. Two more questions, yes. Hi, uh, Secretary Tim James is my name. I'm the Chief Executive at Medicines Australia, the pharmaceutical industry body. You, you alluded to some decisions and consequences fiscally of middle class welfare and budget over expenditure in the mid to late 2000s. And my question is, well, how, how have we learnt from those decisions? How is the system better today? We seem to live in a state in which the politics is constantly triumphing over the good public policy. And how can we, the taxpayers, be more satisfied that we will get smart, sensible, economically sound decisions from our public policy makers? Uh, it's a tough question. Um, I think it's drifted up. Uh, my older son does a real job, he's a school teacher. And he said to me, and he, he's a school teacher in a decent area, he's a primary school teacher, he's a decent area of Melbourne, no, by no means impoverished. I, I grew up in a very impoverished area where you had to fight your way home each night. Uh, it's not the case in Hampton and Melbourne. But he said, Dad, if you want a briefing on the uh, social welfare system, come and talk to one of my parents. They know exactly down to the buck where this cuts in and where that cuts out, uh, what the work activity test is for childcare, stuff like that. Uh, I don't think we have learned. I seriously don't. If I get up and I'm happy in the morning, uh, I feel that there are some green shoots of people recognising it. Some of the better articles in the papers, some of the commentators have uh, been uh, banging on about it in uh, a more articulate way. Um, and I think there's a, there's a bit of a recognition coming. But it is something, frankly, where the more populist commentators on radio or in the newspapers, uh, even on television, will probably be the ones who, who lead the debate because it's getting it over to the general audience that really, if you're getting this welfare, there is a cost to it. And there is a cost, as I said, to uh, the children and uh, the grandchildren. And it's, 
It's, it's tough, though. It's similar to what Percy's question was. It, it's a tough, tough road. We're trying to do our bit by being open. Um, uh, you go to Senate estimates, you try to be open and have a good dialogue and, you know, we'll keep doing it even though you often don't get thanked for it. It's just a case of water on the, on the stone. We'll wear that stone down. Sue Lin? Sue Linong, RBC Capital Markets. Mr Fraser, you talk about the need for fiscal repair um, and the need for it to start now. Um, at this juncture when growth is subtrend and demand is weak, how much of the challenge is that um, as we, in the upcoming budget? Um, particularly when I guess the other arm of, of policy in terms of monetary policy is trying to lend as much support as possible. Yeah, well, it's, it's tough, isn't it? And I said um, somewhere else, You've got to tailor, tailor your situations to your own country, and uh, um, there's a saying in the military in the uh, in the UK that you, you know, you've got to work out what's possible. You don't go fighting when you know you're going to lose. So I think this year I, I won't talk about the budget in particular, but clearly um, the imperatives I think on fiscal repair have been enunciated, and I think there is a general understanding right across the broad, we've got to do something about it. Uh, but I think uh, we've got to set some medium term markers. We've got to be clear where the government wants us to take us with the medium term markers. And then we've got to chip away, chip away. I think uh, also, as I tried to say on Wednesday, fiscal policy is not just about levels of expenditure and revenue, it's about the composition, uh, composition of expenditure and it's the composition of revenues. I got labelled a Reaganite by God knows why, because <laughs> I, I had the temerity to say that uh, when you look at uh, fiscal policy, you've got to also look at the composition of tax measures. Uh, you've got to look in, on the outlays side at the composition of uh, outlays. So it's clearly, to your point, a difficult time for us, and nobody's talking about massive advances in fiscal repair, and that's why I talked about the medium term and the longer term. Uh, as for the role of monetary policy, the, hey, that's for another day. I think, uh, as I said in the speech, uh, probably in 20 years' time, somebody will look back on this period of QE around the world, not, not in Australia. I think Australia, we've been very, very fortunate that monetary policy hasn't had to go down the route or be lured into the route that's taking place in Europe and to a lesser extent in the United States. But I suspect in 20 years' time, somebody will say, what were they thinking? And um, we shall see what comes out of it. But I, you know, at, my, at this stage, it's a case of medium-term markers, making sure the country knows where we're going and can plan accordingly, both individuals and businesses, and working, as I said, chipping away, chipping away to get there. Thank you, John. Uh, I think that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Could I ask David Mortimer, who's uh, also a CEDA governor, they've roped all the CEDA governors into activity today, uh, could I ask David to deliver a vote of thanks?